Life's a climb. But the view's great. Welcome to the Graveyard Slot, where we talk about movies past their prime time. Here, we revisit old favorites with a fresh perspective to see if they deserve more credit or if they should stay buried. I'm Sohini. And I'm Sarah, and today we're talking about Hannah Montana the Movie. Hannah Montana the Movie is based on the Disney Channel show Hannah Montana and follows Smiley Stewart as she returns to her hometown away from the glitz and glamour of her life as a superstar. It was released in 2009. It was also written by Dan Berenson, who was a co-writer for the Disney Channel original movie Camp Rock 2 The Final Jam and the writer of Wizards of Waverly Place the movie. Disney veteran. Yeah. <laughs> So the main reason we chose to discuss this movie is we feel it's judged too harshly based on the target audience it's intended for. People tend to dismiss it quite easily as a typical Disney children's movie that only little kids can enjoy. A good example of this is a review I found from the San Francisco Chronicle which read, If you're no longer old enough to carry a Hannah Montana lunchbox, this movie will feel like punishment. Which I thought was kind of harsh. <laughs> <laughs> Very harsh. Both to viewers who are older, like us, and also to kids who carry Hannah Montana lunchboxes. Like, why <laughs> you gotta attack them like that, you know? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, this movie surprisingly stands pretty well on its own, and it does kind of go out of its way to be its own thing. Yeah, you're right. Of course, it acknowledges the popularity of Hannah Montana due to the show, but it doesn't depend on it to make a good story. You could probably replace Hannah Montana with an original character and it would still be just a really good story. They could have just done the bare minimum, but they didn't. They made a really good movie instead. Yeah, I think you can definitely tell when something like this is purely a cash grab. Mm -hmm. This movie definitely doesn't feel like that. It's got a lot of heart and a lot of charm. And you can tell that the filmmakers did put a lot of thought behind it. I found another review from The Hollywood Reporter that reads, There are sufficient pratfalls and Miley Hannah quick changes to satisfy the fans, while Cyrus retains that natural, unforced likability that made her a star in the first place. And I think this is a fair enough review because a lot of the charm, as you said, is in Miley Cyrus's performance, but not just hers. It's in the whole cast. The whole cast really carries this movie, I think. Not that it needed the help or anything, but it just really strengthens the movie for me. I agree. The cast is one of the best things about this movie. Yeah. I think the movie, in some cases, did need a strong cast to elevate it. Yeah. I think it could have very easily gone in the other direction had the cast not been so good. My personal experience with this movie is that I actually watched it when it first came out in theaters. Ooh. Even though I wasn't even a huge Hannah Montana fan. I was a very casual viewer of the show, but I just went to the movies to go see it. And I absolutely loved it. <laughs> I've seen this movie a few times since then as well and enjoyed it each time. It's a movie with a lot of heart and substance. And that is a hill that I will die on. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I think this is a hill worth dying on. <laughs> I was a huge fan of Hannah Montana when I was younger, but somehow I had the opposite experience of yours where I think I sort of missed the hype around this movie. I just saw it at some point and I remember really enjoying it. I suppose it is difficult in that sense for me to be totally objective about it because I did love Hannah Montana so much when I was younger, but I can say that as an older viewer who isn't as invested in that show anymore, I still do enjoy this movie. So I think that does say something something about the timelessness of the themes in the story and the skill behind the storytelling and the quality of it. Yeah. So as usual, we will be discussing this movie chronologically. And we open with the lead up to a Hannah Montana concert with the crowd and the excitement buzzing in the air. And I have to say, for this movie specifically, it's such a perfect fit because it was a little like getting ready for the movie itself. There was a lot of hype around it from the extremely successful show, obviously. I think it's a really strong start. Yeah, I can only imagine the amount of anticipation that must have been so nice to see mirrored on screen. And the fact that the movie starts with the fans and not with Miley herself, I think is also just a great decision thematically because, you know, this whole story is about Miley learning how to balance these two identities that she has. The fact that we start off with the fans, I think, is a great indication of the power that Hannah has over Miley. And it's emphasized by the fact that Miley herself can't get into the concert. And I think the influence of Hannah 
that is so clearly depicted here makes Miley's reveal later on in the movie hit that much harder because we know how significant a move this is. So like we were talking about before already, the movie doesn't rely on the show at all because even if someone hasn't seen the show at all and isn't all that familiar with the character and everything that Miley has been through as Hannah, we still understand how important this is for her. Yeah, that's a great point. Actually, another great establishing shot is the one after this where we see the wig. Yeah. It establishes the premise perfectly. It's, of course, an iconic and recognizable part of the Hannah Montana persona. And I think it's these little details that does really well to introduce this world and premise without it feeling like they're just reiterating things most of the audience already knows. Mm -hmm. It's a great version as well of the show's opening credits, which would usually be where we get that road to rehashing. I think it helps the movie stand the test of time because in 2009, and now too, I would still say, there wasn't a lot of people who didn't know Hannah Montana and the gist of what it was about, but this really helps the movie stand on its own and be digestible to an audience that isn't as familiar. Yeah, I think it makes me realize how refreshing it is that we don't get that slew of background information through dialogue. It's a really creative way of establishing the context and the relationships between these characters. Yeah. I've also always loved the wig reveal. I think it's such a great way to subvert our expectation because we're hit with the glitz and the glamour of being a pop star and we expect Hannah to be ready for the concert, all calm, cool, collected, and then it pans to reveal that it's just the wig and she can't actually get in. <laughs> Which, you know, sets us up for, I would say, the level of hijinks that we're going to get throughout this movie as well because it starts off chaotic and it remains that way pretty much the whole way <laughs> through. <laughs> On the subject of chaos, every time I watch this movie, the part where they burst through the giant poster of Hannah's giant head stresses me out so much <laughs> because they needed that poster for something. It wasn't just a disposable piece of prop lying around. They were clearly about to set it up somewhere. And that kind of thing costs a fortune. I can never get over that moment. <laughs> What can I say? I suppose it was thematically necessary to <laughs> sacrifice that poster because as heavy-handed as it might be, I think it's a bit of foreshadowing for what's about to come. And also just the size of Hannah's head on Miley's face. I think it's kind of indicating how big-headed she's gotten because of all the <laughs> fame and everything. <laughs> so, you know, sacrifices had to be made. For sure. So we see more of them backstage and we actually see them get ready. And the fact that Lily is doing Miley's hair, I can't decide if it's an annoying inaccuracy that's hard to believe or if it's a great way of once again showing how Hannah isn't a regular pop star. There's so much secrecy surrounding her that she can't even have something as regular as a hair and makeup person at her concert. It both sets her apart, but also makes her seem that much more relatable to the audience where, as a kid, you think when you get famous and you're about to go on stage, it's you and your best friend doing each other's makeup. You know, that's how a kid thinks. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. And I especially like that parallel, knowing, you know, how close close Miley and Lily are and I think despite the kind of outlandish concept of this whole thing you know a pop star with a hidden identity what really makes this character so relatable and so human is the relationships that she has with the people around her so this is just another instance really of us getting to see her in this very out there situation but it's grounded by the relationships and this lovely friendship that she has with Lily. Yeah, we also get to see her relationship with her dad here. There's a half a second shot where Miley's about to change and Robbie Ray has to be reminded to give her her privacy. I think it's another, I don't know if I'd say subtle, but small detail showing how Miley's growing up because that's a lot of what this movie's about. The separation growing with your parents, especially between a teenage girl and her dad. It's a very small thing, but I do think that that moment right there is pretty universal. Yeah, that's a great catch. And stuff like this is what convinces me that this movie is not just for lunchbox carrying kids, you know, because any parent could watch that 
and be able to spot parallels in their own life, I guess. It's not something that'll necessarily stick out to the younger fans. I don't think this relationship between Robbie and Miley necessarily stood out to me when I was younger, but watching it now as an older viewer, I can definitely appreciate the amount of effort they put into fleshing out this relationship and including these themes because it makes the characters more rounded, it puts more meaning into the story, and it just goes to show that they're not just one-dimensional characters. So right before Hannah is about to go on stage, there's this moment between her and her dad where they're having a pretty mundane conversation about doing the dishes and it is a bit on the nose they mentioned the best of both worlds thing which i think they didn't need to it was already very apparent but i do like the contrast between you know the superstardom and the everyday life that she also leads it's very familiar dialogue about chores that you would have with a parent but obviously the context is wildly different yeah so her stage performance transitions into them shooting a music video. I always thought the transition between the scenes was really fun and quite clever. Instead of having the opening song take place in the concert alone and having us sit through the accompanying exposition, they transition from one performance to the next, showing us how hard Miley works while also moving the story along. So I always thought that was a clever bit of storytelling. Yeah. We see this reporter, Oswald, sneak into her dressing room, and I can't help but think that Hannah Montana must have such shitty security. Seriously. For one, that's a superstar's private space. For another, that's a teenage girl's changing room. Yeah, there are multiple occasions throughout this movie where I was very concerned for Miley's safety, honestly, <laughs> because Oswald is basically tailing her throughout this movie, taking pictures of her from a distance, and it's very creepy. And she definitely needs better security. Apparently just Vita and her dad aren't cutting it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's interesting to me that Oswald is using his actual daughter's interest and pictures as his cover. Do you think that says anything about his priorities, maybe his morals even, that he's using them, or at least their identities, to his convenience? Because he could have easily crafted a totally fabricated cover. I think it does serve as a good counterpoint to how we see him by the end of the movie. And now that you mention it, I think this is just a convenient way for them to introduce the daughters. Or maybe his character instead. It gives us a starting point. Right, for sure. Here we also get introduced to Vita, who is Hannah's publicist. They have a conversation here that kind of breaks my heart a bit because Miley says that sometimes she wishes she could be Hannah all the time and Vita actually agrees with her. It makes me feel sad thinking that these are probably the kinds of people that Miley is surrounded by most of the time who either because they don't know her secret or because they're hired to work for Hannah they prioritize Hannah they don't really care about Miley as much yeah. I know her age is a factor as well in her struggling to balance all of this but surely her surroundings and the people around her also have a hand in her coming to prioritize Hannah so much more yeah I think Vita agreeing with her is such a great establishing line for her character. Like you said, she's there for Hannah, not Miley. And I don't think it's inherently bad or good, just the fact of who she is and where her interest lies. Like, it's just her job, you know? To me, the heartbreaking part is the fact that Miley says that to Vita in the first place. It shows how she's losing sight of why she wanted this best of both worlds arrangement. Yeah, I mean, also the fact that Miley is thinking like this, I think operates on different levels because yes, on one hand, it is the glitz and the glamour and there's also certain freedoms and certain privileges that she gets from being Hannah, which, you know, we can talk about more in detail later on. But the way that this character is framed allows for this to work on multiple different levels. So it's not just that Miley comes across as superficial for wanting to be a superstar. We understand and why she feels this way. Yeah, exactly. And you know what? Maybe I don't even blame Miley for wanting to be Hannah all the time because we get a smash cut to her being Miley and she's being hit in the face with a volleyball. <laughs> the glorious experiences of sports class in high school. Great. <laughs> 
But Miley does get to escape because Vita takes her out of school to go prep for an award show where she's filling in for Beyonce. And that says a lot about where she is in her career, that she's second choice after Beyonce. <laughs> this is a very specific moment in her life. It's not just like, oh, now she's a big star and that's why we have the issue. It's a very specific moment in time where she is at the height of her career, I think. Yeah, I think someone in the movie refers to her as the most popular teenager in the world. And I think you make a great point because we slowly see Hannah's world seeping into Miley's to the point where it doesn't really matter where she's at. If it's school, if she's missing class, if she's missing her commitments that she has to family or her friends, it's always Hannah who is prioritized first. The first commitment she misses because of this sudden change of plans is Jackson leaving for college in Tennessee. We see him perching on the window of a car and immediately face planting. <laughs> yes. My question is, is Jackson breaking his face on asphalt the first way Jackson could die? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. The first of many ways Jackson could die in this movie. Yes, this is a very special segment we have just for this movie. <laughs> yeah, because it's actively trying to kill one of its characters. Honestly, I was so concerned for Jackson's safety while I was watching this movie because throughout there are genuinely so many moments where he could literally die. So we will be keeping track. And this is number one. Yes, many more coming up. But we get a shoe fight with Tyra Banks when Miley finds a pair of shoes she thinks Lily would like. And I think this is another instance of seeing how Hannah's fame has gone to Miley's head. She's much too used to being treated as the most important person in the room. I don't know if I 100% agree with you on that because just moments before she was talking to Vita about how she feels weird about being given all these free things just because a picture of her using them would be so valuable. But I do agree that to some extent I think she has gotten used to getting her way and having everything she wants at the tips of her fingers this is definitely one of those instances where you know she's relying on her reputation as Hannah Montana to get what she wants even if it is for someone else they end up going straight to Lily's birthday after this because they ran late but Oswald, the reporter, is following them, and so Miley can't leave the car looking like herself. So Miley has to show up as Hannah at the party, mm -hmm. and everyone's attention immediately goes to her, and Lily's super disappointed because all she wanted was her best friend to be there, not this frenzy, you know? And everyone sweeps Hannah onto the stage and starts demanding that she perform, so she just basically ends up taking the focus away from Lily, so Lily's about to leave the party. You know, I think Miley should have sing Happy Birthday instead of the song they were chanting for. Bring it back around to Lily. Yeah, that does make sense. And I do wish Miley had tried a little bit harder to draw the focus back to Lily, but I can kind of understand her succumbing to the pressure of the fans because the fact that they don't even let her say anything, the moment they see her, they pretty much start chanting sing and and when she's on stage, it's not even her name they're chanting. They're chanting crazy, 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 demanding that she sing this song. So I can kind of understand how she couldn't veer into the happy birthday song. But that scene always did break my heart. Same. I feel really bad for her here. And now that you've put it that way, it makes me really sad. Like, this is all people care about when it comes to Hannah. They don't even care why she's there in the first place. They just see her and start demanding that she perform. I guess like everyone in Hannah's life just wants something from her, which makes actually what happens later kind of sad that Lorelai, while Hannah did act really poorly, but Lorelai is upset that she can't get what she wanted from Hannah's visit. In a way. Yeah, that is true. I guess that's just an inevitable part of her job. Yeah. Even people with good intentions might, you know, want something from you. Yeah. Afterwards, Robbie Ray is understandably upset at Miley for her behavior, and he says that he finds out about the New York Music Awards because he got CC'd in an email, which again shows the distance growing between them. Miley is morphing more and more into Hannah, and there's that separation between them where even her dad has to jump through all these hoops to know what's going on with her. Yeah, I think once again, it's evidence of aspects of Hannah's life seeping into Miley's. Just 
her identity taking over even her relationship with not only her friends, but her dad too. You know, this is a problem because here we get another choice that Miley has to make between her two lives clashing and fighting for space, namely going to Tennessee for her grandma's birthday or performing at the award show. The fact that he's insisting that she go uh, visit her grandma for her birthday is not necessarily because the two things are equal in importance, but he just wants her to remember her roots. I think he's seeing his daughter change in ways that alarm him. And I think it's just an attempt to get her to realize that she's going in the wrong direction. Yeah, for sure. But we get one of my favorite lines from him where Vida refers to her as Hannah to her dad. And he says, her name is Smiley. I think that sums it up pretty well. Yeah, it encapsulates the entire message or objective or whatever of the movie, which is finding Miley again under Hannah Montana and remembering that part of herself. And we can all relate to this, right? The story is packaged in a high-end world where a teenage girl gets to be a world-famous pop star. But we get into these times in our lives where certain parts of ourselves are taking up more space than it should, maybe even a certain persona we've projected into the world around us that we get lost in. And we kind of need to recenter ourselves and maybe go back to our roots and find what we truly value and remember our real name, so to speak. That is a great way of putting it. Once again, we see that this movie can work on several different levels because it's not just about a pop star with a hidden identity. The message and the themes can apply to a broad spectrum of situations. And the fact that this line comes from her dad is even more so powerful because of this relationship that they've already established. Yeah, and the character Hannah Montana is very much one that they created together. So just having that line come from him is so meaningful. Yeah, because he knows what Hannah means to her, but ultimately it's always going to be Miley that he's looking out for yeah but that line is just perfect the delivery is great as well it comes off a little annoyed a little disappointed is very pointed with his tone it's such a simple line that does a lot for the themes of this movie in that moment robbie ray does seem to relent and says that Miley can go to the awards and so they get this private jet and Miley's all ready with her fancy outfit and her wig but when the plane lands what do you know they're in Tennessee (laughs) and she pops out so dramatically and her welcoming crew is a couple of cows (laughs) and Jackson with a truck (laughs) yes We get a whole back and forth between Miley and Robbie Ray about her commitments. And the part that breaks my heart is when Miley doesn't recognize blue jeans. It's such a huge part of her character, how much she loves her horse. It's a meaningful, established part of her. And I think this, out of everything so far, is what really hits me, that Miley's really lost her way. It's just such a great shorthand. Yeah, and especially because at one point, she uses her suitcases that she's got to try and get up on blue jeans. It's almost like being back in this place and seeing blue jeans again, even if she doesn't acknowledge it, it almost immediately starts to put things into perspective a little because yes, it's Hannah's glamorous stuff, but ultimately they're just things. But it's also like literal Hannah baggage. Yeah, exactly. Her trying to get on blue jeans with the Hannah baggage, I think it's a great way of showing her struggle, balancing her two different identities because she gets up on the horse, but the moment she tries to reach down for the suitcases she's thrown off again there's a shot of Miley turning around with the wind blowing her hair and it's quite beautiful though I do have to laugh at Travis's oh so cinematic entrance (laughs) yeah (laughs) you know they knew each other as kids and they meet again here so Travis ends up taking her to her grandma's place because Robbie and Jackson just left her there because she was sulking (laughs) yeah she was the one throwing a tantrum (laughs) yeah during this ride back to the grandma's house, Miley makes up some lie about being best friends with Hannah Montana to kind of prove that celebrities or whatever are just like regular people and this lie bites her in the ass <laughs> later. <laughs> yep. I think Miley and Travis have pretty good chemistry. A lot of it is thanks to their acting, but the lines land pretty well. I think this was a solid start and foundation to how their friendship progresses. Yeah, I think some of it is definitely down to their timing. The dialogue is very snappy and it all sounds very natural and it's like they fall back into a familiar rhythm and that definitely sells their initial friendship and connection for me. 
Miley arrives at her grandmother's house to everybody singing backwards, performed by Rascal Flatts, which is very thematically on point. (laughs) (laughs) And her reluctance and struggle with jumping in says a lot about where she is mentally as well. Before, something like this would be right up her alley and just her kind of thing. Even in the show, it's more of a country girl in a big city kind of thing. Now it's almost like she's too good for it. I can kind of see that. A part of it is also just, I think, not necessarily thinking that she's too good for it now, but just having forgotten. And that's not always in your control. Yeah, she's disconnected from that part of herself now. But I do like how music ties everyone in the family together. This is not the first time we see music being a very communal thing for them. Whereas, you know, for someone like Hannah, she would be up on stage solo performing in front of thousands of people. So it's like two very different experiences of music. And I do like that with this change of setting that we get, she returns to how she was probably first introduced to music in the first place, which is as a way to bond with the people close to you and something that you enjoy together. Yeah, It's a very fitting welcome back, definitely, even if she doesn't appreciate it at first. For sure. As a kid, the sequence with Robbie Ray ruining all the grandma's plates always made me crack up. (laughs) I think that's a neat little sequence of physical comedy, which this movie has a lot of. Yeah, you're right. There's definitely a lot of physical comedy in this movie. I think this is one of the more successful instances because there are some scenes that I think are way too much, but I think this one hits the balance between wacky but not too much so. Yeah, again, I think it's, as you said before, I think the cast really helps in selling it. It's just like you said, in the hands of a different cast, this would fall very flat, but because they have such like seasoned actors, it works. Like they pull it off. Yeah. We see Miley and her grandma have a little talk. And this is where we hear the saying about the caterpillar for the first time. Literally for the first time, because it's never brought (laughs) up in the show. (laughs) Yeah, But a small thing to note here, I think, is that she remarks that her dad doesn't say that to her much anymore. And it's a small peek into how the distance between Miley and her dad is from her perspective. The narrative so far has shown us how it feels to Robbie Ray, what has changed for him. But this little moment, I think, shows that Miley's very much feeling it too coming from his end. Not necessarily in the same way she's been pushing him away, just in that more natural growing up where your parents stopped doing the little things that comforted you as a young child. Yeah, that is a great point. It could be that this change of setting has maybe helped her to be a little bit more introspective because it does seem like so far she's kind of taken her family and friends for granted. And this is the first moment where we see her have a break and actually interact with a family member. I guess being home again just reminds her of the relationship she used to have with her family, especially her dad, because they used to be so close. Yeah, and it's so lovely that you know, initially she's feeling this distance between her and her dad and she's reflecting on how he doesn't say this to her anymore. But, you know, later on we get this turnaround where she's the one who turns that saying into something from her perspective and something that she's now saying to him. So I think it's a really nice development. This movie is clearly a coming-of-age story, and it tells the whole growing up narrative really well. The marrying of who you're becoming and who you were, though of course through extremes. Which I think brings up the point that this Hannah Montana premise almost serves as a laughably convenient way to explore the theme of growing up. Because you get to have (laughs) Hannah Montana as this grown-up adult version, for example, and Miley as who she used to be. I think it just facilitates this kind of story really well. Yeah, this is actually really nice to see because normally it's the other way around, isn't it? Where you have this very popular character that you want to have in as many movies and franchises as you can. And so you have to think up more and more stories around them. But here it feels like the other way around where they had this theme they wanted to explore and Hannah just happened to be a convenient vessel to explore it through. Exactly. Also, I really like how... Miley is not portrayed as the typical angsty teenager. Like, she does have moments where she disagrees with her dad, and yes, she did throw a bit of a tantrum, but I just really like how they still reconcile and they come together in the end to comfort each other and encourage each other to pursue what they want to pursue, and it's just a really nice depiction of a father-daughter relationship. Yeah. 
In an effort to save Hannah Montana, Miley starts to really throw herself into life in Tennessee and show her dad that country Miley is still part of her. (laughs) (laughs) So now she's suddenly all gung-ho about doing chores and very ineffectively doing them (laughs) as Robbie Ray and the grandma watch on. (laughs) I really think this movie does a pretty good job with the humor. It was very funny. We get more ways Jackson could die when he's working at the zoo. (laughs) Yes. He's bit by the ostrich and bit by a crocodile. Poor guy, honestly. (laughs) And they sent him into this place knowing that it's dangerous. We see two gigantic signs that say, I bite. (laughs) And you see poor little Jackson (laughs) wrestling with the animals. (laughs) Yeah. I guess that is numbers two and three. Yeah. (laughs) In the list of ways Jackson could die. So we get a subplot about the gentrification of Crowley Corners. They're trying to save the town from developers circling the waters. You know, even this subplot is really on theme for the movie. This almost inevitable change that's coming for them. And it's a bit of a struggle to hold on to a piece of yourself in the face of all that. Be it growing up, Hannah Montana's stardom, or developers trying to buy out Crowley Corners. Because a big theme of this movie isn't just growing up it's change in other senses as well it's not just miley changing into hannah it's the status quo of hannah herself changing say to oblivion if robbie ray follows through on his threat it's the change of what hannah means to miley so this subplot plays really well into all of that and imagine if it really does happen now miley doesn't have a home to come back to or at least not one she can recognize and again this is something we all go through you kind of can't go home to what you had as a kid you go back and it doesn't look the same doesn't feel the same doesn't have the same people and miley is so lucky to have something like that That is a great parallel. And I think it works especially well because of Miley's very singular circumstance. There's really no other character who could serve as a foil for exactly what she's going through. But by introducing these parallel plot lines, which don't emulate her specifically, but mirror what she's going through, I think the movie does a great job of not only distinguishing these characters and especially Miley in the way that she goes about dealing with it, but it also gives us multiple themes that a wide audience can work with. Because I for sure did not understand nor appreciate this gentrification plotline when I was younger. This was for those who don't have Hannah Montana (laughs) lunchboxes. (laughs) Yes, exactly. But watching it now as an older viewer, I can appreciate even more the level of nuance that is in this story. Yeah. So next we see Miley and her grandmother at the local market. And guess who's come snooping around? It's Oswald. There's a sequence of him like accidentally eating a ton of hot chili and I think this was the cheesiest bit from the movie for me. It feels more fitting to the show which is more gimmicky. Yeah I agree with you. I think this together with the mayor's dinner are my least favorite scenes. It's just too much. It doesn't do that much for the story and I guess it's supposed to be like a break for humor but it doesn't quite land but he's there to get some dirt on hannah and actually asks smiley about hannah (laughs) so she leads him to an abandoned house in the middle of nowhere and another comedic thing they do here is that he ends up in a puddle of mud in the woods while he's on the phone with his boss who's in a mud bath at a spa (laughs) aside from the comedic aspect i think it does work pretty well in contrasting their positions yeah some interesting social commentary there (laughs) it is a fun touch they didn't have to do this but it just goes to show the amount of care they put into this movie and the level of detail yeah later on we see miley working on a song that she'll basically be developing throughout this movie travis makes a comment about how it's not really about anything and i think it's a great line about how hannah's kind of lost what she's about she's no longer grounded and real enough to even inject the emotion and authenticity needed for her music it's actually kind of funny that miley has more identities than the regular person yet you know still can't put any of it into her music (laughs) (laughs) that's a that's a harsh burn it's just ironic 
There's this exchange between Miley and Travis about the rundown chicken coop, and it shows really well how Miley's perspective and point of view has changed. Because she makes a remark basically about how Travis's dreams are like small potatoes, and her stakes are just so high now that she's lost sight of the value these small, meaningful experiences can still bring. How the songs she was singing to no one but her family that didn't top the charts or anything still had value and mattered. Yeah, that's a great point. Travis serves as a good counterpoint to Miley and I think it adds a great balance to their relationship that he can reintroduce her to these simple pleasures that she forgot when she left home. And this is where we actually get a sequence of them hanging out and just, you know, exploring. We also get to see Robbie Ray and his love interest, Lorelai, bond over time. During this time, Miley does help Travis rebuild the chicken coop, which was a nice touch. She gains a bit of perspective, I guess. Crowley Corners holds a fundraiser and the whole town basically attends. And there's this conversation between Robbie Ray and Lorelai that is great insight into how much Hannah Montana has taken up their family's life. It's such a big and all-consuming thing that Robbie Ray's lost sight of his priorities too, putting himself last after his kids, which is something a lot of parents do and often fall into this almost rut of losing their identity to solely parenting. And in this story, it's of course another high-end version of that. So seeing Robbie Ray take a breath from all of that and think about how he's doing and what he wants is really nice. Yeah, and I like that Miley encourages him to do so as well. I also really like how Lorelai does catch on to the fact that this family does have secrets that they're keeping and they don't really let a lot of outsiders in. I like that she notices and I like that this plays a role later on as well as their relationship develops because it becomes a source of disappointment for her that Robbie Ray can't be entirely honest with her. And it's especially significant that Miley witnesses this because I think of course, she must know the sacrifices that her dad has made for her, but she realizes the true extent when she finds out how her actions not only are affecting her, but Robbie Ray as well. Yeah, I just really like how we see how much Hannah Montana affects everyone around Miley's life. And I think this would have been a great opportunity to build on Jackson's character as well, because in the show, they did touch upon Jackson's perspective, having a superstar sister and sometimes feeling neglected because all of Robbie Ray's attention was going to Miley but they don't really use that at all in this movie instead I think Jackson just sort of becomes a source of physical comedy and nothing else and I think this is one of the weaker points of the movie because they had such an interesting contrast in Jackson compared to Miley the fact that he's adjusting so well in his hometown compared to Miley they could have done a lot with him but instead you could take him out of this movie and it wouldn't really make a difference which is a shame. Yeah. They put so much effort into everybody else. Literally every other character in this movie is so relevant to the plot in one way or another. And they do such a good job at weaving so many storylines and having such an ensemble cast. And Jackson is so underutilized. And especially because the theme of familial ties is so central to this movie, it makes a lot of sense that Jackson would also be included. Even a simple conversation between him and Miley could have told us so much more about their characters, but we don't even get them interacting all that much. At this fundraiser, Miley ends up singing Hoedown Throwdown at the open mic. I think this performance is the first time that we're seeing Miley's two identities coming together. It's her skill as a performer coming through as well as her embracing her roots. And it's the first successful instance of her balancing the two worlds together. And the product of it is a fun time. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it also just conveys really well why Miley chose to do this in the first place. It's because of her love of music. Yeah, you get to see Miley actually make music on the spot and perform pretty organically as opposed to the high-end production Hannah Montana has become. And it is something she really enjoys and is just truly a performer at heart. 
And there's this one shot of Robbie Ray coming back inside and seeing all this go down. And it's a moment where he gets to see a glimpse of why Hannah Montana was even created in the first place. And I know he's not the one who forgot about that, but he gets to see that it is still very much present. I think the performance must serve as a reminder for them both. It's also a big moment for him, I think, of seeing that no matter what he does, even if Hannah Montana is no longer in their lives, Miley will always be this incredibly talented kid that will want to perform. He can't really take that away from her. That's a part of Miley, not Hannah. I think this is something that Miley herself forgets. I think she puts way too much importance into the wig, even though that's the least important thing, really. Yeah. I didn't realize back then how much of this story is framed through Robbie Ray's perspective. As we're watching her, he's also watching her, and it allows the story to be framed with so much affection. It adds so much to the themes of this movie, and it ties everything together so well. Again, this is a huge indication to me that this movie is so much more than it seems on the surface. We see the developer come in and kind of mock them for even trying to save the town. And Travis volunteers Miley to ask Hannah Montana to perform and help their fundraising. And I'm sorry, but Travis comes off as sort of naive. It could easily be that Miley was lying about Hannah Montana just to seem cool or whatever. Or that she exaggerated how well she knows Hannah Montana when they just met in passing once. I kind of just see it as grasping at straws at this point because they are desperate enough to resort to any solution, even though his better judgment might be telling him that it's not realistic. I think he just still goes for it and hopes for the best. <laughs> But now that Travis has put her in this really tight spot, Hannah Montana actually comes to town and it's Lily as a stand-in. It's really nice to see Miley and Lily make up, though I had forgotten at this point that they were on the outs. I think the movie does fail to emphasize this rift because I forgot about it as soon as they got to Tennessee. The relationship is such a huge part of Hannah Montana the show that it's strange to me that this conflict is so much in the background to the point of obscurity up to this runtime. Yeah, absolutely. This is also one of the big bigger complaints I have with the movie because I think they set up certain conflicts really well including the one at Lily's birthday party but the fallout isn't proportional to the amount of setup we get. The moment at the party was so heartbreaking but we don't really get any acknowledgement from it outside of the party from Miley let alone from Lily. As soon as Miley is removed from that setting Lily leaves her mind altogether. We never see any attempts from her to make things up to Lily like she promised and Lily also forgives her pretty easily once they're together in Tennessee again. So I would have liked to see more development on that front. But I am glad that Lily has now joined us in Tennessee as part of the main cast. And this is the start of a really funny sequence of scenes that I think is really well done. They just have great comedic timing, which is what helps most with the more wacky jokes. At one point, however, Jackson falls off a ladder into a patch of squashes, which is number four in all the ways Jackson could die. He basically becomes a walking jack-o'-lantern. And it's so funny to me that in the next scene, his grandma looks so annoyed <laughs> that he, he <laughs> ruined her squashes. She doesn't care that he almost broke his neck. She's like, my poor squashes. <laughs> It was a three-story drop. At this point, he should have a broken leg. He should have a chunk eaten out of his ass. That was the first one. He should have like a broken nose. I think at this point, we can safely say that Jackson must be immortal because after all these attempts on his life, he's still standing. Mm -hmm. Go Jackson. But actually, Hannah meets Travis and basically finds out he's really into Miley and encourages him to go and ask her out. So he does. This leads to the big wacky sequence of Miley and Hannah needing to be at two different places at once. And I don't love it. My biggest pet peeve is a conflict that doesn't naturally occur, especially one with a solution that is logical but our characters don't take for no real reason. It's clear that Miley should have just rescheduled the date. But if they really wanted this to happen, an easy fix would have been to give her a reason to not be able to reschedule, have her busy with rehearsals for Hannah's show for the fundraiser or something. I just need the driving force of the conflict to be convincing. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. This is definitely one of the movie's weaker moments, which is a shame because of the emotional punch it packs at the end when one of Hannah's fans discovers that, you know, it's actually Miley and it would have been nice 
to see some stronger storytelling. It could have been something as simple as Miley committing to the dinner with the mayor and telling someone to convey to Travis that she can't go on the date, but you know, somehow the message doesn't get relayed. She sees him waiting for her and she goes to try and tell him that she can't make it. And that's when someone sees her taking off the wig. Like it works out so easily. And once again, I think it's the movie trying to be too funny and prioritizing physical comedy over the actual quality of the story. Because honestly, this back and forth doesn't really serve any real purpose other than to just try and make us laugh, I guess. We do get yet another way, Jack, Jackson could die. <laughs> this one is the most likely to kill him, I think, mm -hmm. which is getting stuck in the revolving door and his throat getting crushed by his dad. It horrifies me. The whole reason he's there in the first place, which is chasing after a ferret, is so arbitrary. I think if anything, this goes to show how unimportant Jackson is to the plot. <laughs> That's true. At one point, Miley runs out, still in her Hannah look, ripping her wig off as she's going round and round the revolving door, which she goes through way too many times, like at least three or four times, over and over <laughs> again. <laughs> Maybe she can't tell the difference between the inside and the outside. <laughs> yeah. But two people see her, one of whom is a little girl who's a fan, and the other, unfortunately, is Travis. The big thing that always bugs me about this movie is that right up until it's all but spelled out, I always thought the conclusion that Travis must come to after seeing Miley in Hannah's clothes and a wig is that she was lying about knowing Hannah Montana and is just pretending to be her when the lie caught up to her and she somehow had to materialize Hannah Montana out of nowhere. That Miley's just a regular girl who has been lying about her connections instead of someone who has been secretly performing as Hannah Montana for years. That is so not the obvious conclusion to me. Travis hasn't even seen this Hannah sing or anything, so it could very well be an imposter. <laughs> I mean, I can definitely see your point. It does seem a little bit out there for Travis to just hit the mark that quickly. I guess the only explanation I can think of is that they obviously all know what Hannah looks like. And so when Hannah arrives, she looks like Hannah. <laughs> they have no reason to think that she's an imposter, you know? And it might be that moment of realization after she's taken off the wig where it hits him that, hey, this is the same person. <laughs> Yeah, the kid though is probably going to write a book someday. Yeah, seriously. It's not every day you discover an international pop star's secret identity. Jokes aside though, this scene is quite heartbreaking when the girl sees Miley with the wig off and her makeup slightly smudged. It's a huge disillusionment, you know, compared to the sparkly pop star that you've probably only seen on TV and in magazines. And to see her all of a sudden right in front of you, but in such a different state must be so jarring. I really like the setting that this whole scene took in as well. The revolving door was contained enough that it made sense that no one else saw her and also a good symbol for Miley's very roundabout way of approaching this whole conflict. Yeah, you know, now that you've put it that way, it does kind of again drive home the significance of Hannah Montana as an entity, as a persona to millions of people. And you can understand why Miley makes the choices that she does because she understands that significance and that magnitude. And this little girl is representing that pressure for Miley. And especially contrasted to Travis, you know? And it's also a moment where these two very different people in her lives finally see her stripped down. The people who see her as only Hannah and the people who see her as only Miley. Yeah. And the relationships she has with these two groups of people that are very unique. That's a great point. I always thought the girl thing was just like for fun. I didn't really think too much about it. But now that you've put it that way, it's definitely not just an added on thing. Like the girl needs to be there. I really like the way you put that as well. You know, Miley facing these two very 
different pressures in her life head on because I think throughout the story we've seen her struggling with two very different worlds and they're represented in very different ways as well because with Hannah the magnitude is in the numbers in the thousands of people who look up to her in the hordes of fans that crowd her wherever she goes and with Miley the magnitude is not in the numbers but it's in the significance of her personal relationships you know her friendship with Lily her relationship with her dad and her grandmother and I think this is the first time in this scene where we see both forces represented by one character and it becomes much more equal and I think this is where Miley realizes that she has to choose one like you said it's really important for the girl to be there because this is her driving force to finally make that important decision between the two worlds yeah and it's also very important that this happens while she's in a very vulnerable state she can't just run away either you know (laughs) with the way that she looks and with the setting it all works together quite well to convey the suffocation that she must be feeling at this point. Right after all of this goes down, Robbie Ray breaks things off with Lorelai. And it's yet another instance of him putting his needs last in lieu of Hannah Montana. And I think it's really important that Miley sees it go down, just like you said. And she sees what Hannah Montana has done, not only to her, but also those around her. It's not just ruining her relationships with her friends, like Lily, or to potential romantic relationships like with Travis, but also her dad's relationship with those around him. Yeah, exactly. And with what happened with her fan and with Travis, this is... Yet another blow to Miley and I think an especially significant one because of her actions and her disregard for the people around her, someone who cares so much for her and has sacrificed so much for her is suffering. So yeah, I think it makes for a convincing turning point in Miley's attitude and the actions that she chooses to take from this point on. Yeah. One thing I would have liked to see here, though, is more consequences for what Miley did. Because in the space of one day, she's basically destroyed everything that she spent years building up. Honestly, that scene at the mayor's dinner makes me really anxious because she's acting so disrespectful towards everyone. I mean, I understand they want things from her, just like everybody else. But this is for a cause that surely she should be more involved in because it involves her hometown. Yeah, I just would have liked to see more consequences for Miley because no one is really that upset at her considering everything that she did during the dinner. Yeah. I think they failed in doing this, but this is the thing. Hannah isn't a real person. She doesn't have consequences to face. She takes off the wig and Hannah doesn't exist anymore. The mayor or Lorelai or whoever can't go yell at Hannah because Hannah's not a real person. Hannah doesn't have a dad whose life she's disrupting. Hannah doesn't have a best friend waiting for her at her sweet 16th. That's all Miley, and Miley for some reason doesn't matter anymore in the face of Hannah Montana's importance and stardom. I wonder if at some point Miley clings to Hannah so hard because of that because Hannah has this fabricated life that's much easier and doesn't have consequences or whatever. Like we have discussed earlier, Hannah might be the preferable life because of the privileges she has. But not only that, it's because of the absence of consequence. And I think the movie fails to touch on that, but it is an interesting layer to this question of responsibility and identity. Yeah, that is a great point. I guess the only person who can reach out to Hannah in that way is Robbie Ray. Yeah! And I do like that even though in the beginning he was so upset at her actions, here he responds with sympathy and warmth instead of telling her off because even though she might not have gone about things in the best way, she's trying and that's enough. Following this, Miley's kind of been keeping to herself and she writes this song on her own and her dad finds her and they sing it together. This is the song with the caterpillar saying and it's a really touching moment, honestly. It's an incredibly relatable concept and song. This idea of looking back and realizing that somebody, a parent or a guardian or whoever, did a lot for you and it wasn't easy and you couldn't really understand the magnitude as a child but obviously as an adult it seems 
impossible to do, especially because he was kind of doing it alone, apparently. The song very much is from his perspective as well, having to let go of your kid and see them flourish on their own, away from the world you've built for them, which is very much a present thread throughout this movie where Robbie Ray has to kind of sit back and let Miley find her own way, make her own mistakes so that she can flourish the way she was meant to. Yeah, I think the song works so well on so many different levels because as you say it's from Robbie Ray's perspective to some extent as he watches his daughter grow up and Miley also makes it her own and turns it into an acknowledgement of everything that he's done for her and it comes off as especially sincere I think because Miley just witnessed this break between Robbie Ray and Lorelai and it's also Miley returning to her roots once more with this saying that was pretty formative to her childhood and in a way it's like she's understanding her dad's purpose in bringing her back to Tennessee. The scene with her and her dad is also the first time we see Miley singing off stage in the entirety of this movie. It's nice to see her reconnecting with her dad over music just between the two of them. The next day is the fundraiser concert, and right before it starts, we see Miley and her grandmother have a little heart-to-heart. Her grandmother gives her a necklace that used to belong to her mother. That's kind of sweet. Yeah, I do really like seeing their relationship where they may not be as close as they used to be, but there's clear care there. It's like maybe she's not as involved as Robbie Ray in the whole thing, but I think she does understand Miley's position somewhat because what else could giving her the necklace right before the concert symbolize apart from wanting Miley to remember her roots and wanting her to protect her identity as Miley and not let Hannah take over. And I think it's also like the first time her grandma realizes just how much influence Hannah has and how difficult it must be because she says something like, oh, is it always like this out there? And they're screaming fans and everything. And it's nice to see her family also understand her a little bit because this whole movie has been the other way around. Yeah. But Miley proceeds to reveal her real identity on stage mid-concert. And it's always freaked me out that we're to believe she spontaneously chooses to reveal her secret in public. It's not just giving up a career is the thing. It's giving up a whole life, hers and Hannah's. I think it's telling of the mindset of someone that young to not really give as much of a thought to the repercussions than you probably should. When we were that young, we almost have a blind spot for a consequence, right? She hasn't even talked it through with Vera or a lawyer or her dad. While it is impulsive to just up and do it, I can't say that it was a thoughtless decision because given what happened just a while ago, I can imagine that it must have weighed really heavily on Miley's mind. I do think this decision to reveal her identity is a significant turning point for Miley and it's a moment where we finally see her take the responsibility that she's been evading as Hannah because by revealing who she really is to the world, she's also shouldering the responsibility for every mistake she's made for every person that she's hurt and I think even though yeah it is impulsive it just shows how far she's come compared to the beginning of the movie you're right when you put it that way I think it is instead a moment of real maturity from her unfortunately we end on a less then perfect note we get the sequence of oswald giving up his job and everything is a bit too cheesy for me i have to admit it's very cartoonish for my taste i agree especially because we do see him basically use his daughters for his own advantage early on in the movie it doesn't make sense for him to change his mindset that quickly when he sees them at the concert and suddenly he doesn't want to ruin their perception of hannah montana i'm not convinced that he has enough motivation to just do a 180 all of a sudden. It definitely feels way too convenient. We already have all the threads tied together pretty neatly by the end. They couldn't leave this one thing to be more realistic. 
I feel like they should have backed up Oswald's change of heart with more of a moral revelation or dilemma for him. Maybe he's discovered that celebrities he has unfairly tarnished are sometimes decent regular people. Maybe his kids say that they want to grow up to be just like Hannah and he realizes what it is he's truly doing here. Just something more grounded than what we do get. So it's a revelation of self for him as well. I think that would have been great. I think it would have also tied in pretty well with the themes that the movie has been exploring so far if he realized that the people he's been targeting are real people. But I think an even more realistic ending would have been him facing the consequences for everything that he's done. Like I get that it's part of his job or whatever, but that doesn't excuse it. If he, instead of like quitting, like he doesn't go as far as to quit, but to say, I, I don't have anything. And then his boss fires him and that's his consequence. You know what I'm saying? And it's him becoming a better version of himself without it going too far too quickly. Yeah. So, in absurd conclusion, Travis is kind of dumb. <laughs> he came off as pretty naive, thinking Miley really does know Hannah. His leap of logic when it comes to Miley's identity is a bit absurd to me. <laughs> or maybe he's a secret genius. Who knows? <laughs> Yeah, we've had the conclusion backwards this whole time. <laughs> He's actually super smart. Right on the money, that Travis. Yeah. <laughs> Our second absurd conclusion is that Jackson must be immortal because despite numerous assassination attempts, he survived. <laughs> He made it to the end of the movie. We don't know what happened afterwards, but I hope he's safe. <laughs> Our final absurd conclusion is that someone definitely got fired for that poster going missing that Miley and Lily ruined. <laughs> you know what? I think it was Hannah who was fired for ruining that poster. This whole plot to take her to Tennessee has just been a ruse to hide the fact that she's actually fired and no <laughs> longer has a job in the industry. Well, I really enjoy this movie, clearly. I've always loved it, and I will always love this movie. I think they did a great job at portraying themes of change and identity, especially the growing distance in a relationship like Robbie Ray and Miley's. I highly recommend it. If you have any doubts, just forget that it's a Hannah Montana movie, because let's be honest, if it hadn't been Hannah, people would take it more seriously, and they should. So I definitely recommend this movie. Yeah, same here. I loved it when I was a kid and I love it now even more having looked at it with a more discerning eye and having found so many layers of nuance and you can tell that it really comes from a place of care. So it's absolutely worth a watch whether you're a fan of Hannah Montana or not because it's just good storytelling. It really is. <laughs> That's all for this episode. Next time, we'll be discussing Letters to Juliet. If you have any thoughts to share on the movie, send them in at graveyard underscore slot on Twitter and Instagram, or email us at thegraveyardslot at gmail.com so we can share on the podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Graveyard Slot. Graveyard Slot.